All right. This is the end of the paved route. Maintaining link scale 4.4 beyond LTS. I am somebody who has been paid to do Linux stuff for a very long time. A few weird acronyms that need to be defined so you all understand what I'm talking about here. CIP is the Civil Infrastructure Platform. It's provided by the Civil Infrastructure Platform Project. And it's a kernel and user space for civil infrastructure and uh, industrial applications. The, uh, the Linux stable kernel maintainers once in a while pick a branch of the Linux kernel and maintain it as the LTS long-term support kernel. And uh, this is maintained for a couple of years and it's something that is used uh, most prominently in Android and Debian and in some other applications. Once in a while, the Civil Infrastructure Platform project picks one of these LTS kernels and chooses it uh, as the super long-term support kernel. And the way that works is that uh, while LTS is maintained, the SLTS kernel runs in parallel with the LTS kernel. And once LTS goes uh, out of support, the CIP project takes over and maintains that kernel for as long as it takes, but for a minimum of 10 years. And this is what I'm going to talk about today, the SLTS kernel, how and why. When you talk about old kernels, people have opinions. Um, when uh, the CIP project was looking for an additional kernel maintainer, who eventually became me, or I became that maintainer, um, Chris Patterson was scouring the darkest corners of the internet to find a suitable candidate. And one day he dropped into a private IRC channel where I and a bunch of other embedded kernel developers hang out and asked if somebody wants to help with that. So this is the first reaction we got, he got. Uh, maintaining a gerontic vendor kernel with a billion backported patches until the end of times? Sounds exciting. Not really. Uh, a lot of people don't want to do that kind of stuff. I don't know why. I'm quite happy with that. But uh, yeah, this is a matter of personal preference. So people just viscerally don't like that idea, like old stuff. We don't like to maintain that. Um, another kind of feedback that uh, we got is uh, after the announcement by uh, Pavel Mocek that we are going to keep maintaining the 4.4 kernel as an SLTS kernel, <laughs> a prominent kernel maintainer wrote this it costs more money and time the older the kernel is to keep it alive, and it's cheaper and easier to use more modern kernels. Well, uh, how valid that argument is and how relevant it is, is something I'm going to be talking about today. And uh, to understand that, we need to talk a bit about time scales. How you perceive time depends on what hat you're wearing. If you are like, a chip designer, you think in nanoseconds. If you're a geologist, you think in millions of years. Linux kernel developers think sort of like that. Now is the time where we are at. Last uh, release was a complete bogus uh, done by imbeciles. We don't talk about that anymore. And uh, 12 years ago, that's antiquity. It was kernel 2.6. Now I'm poking fun at this, but if you tell me kernel 2.6, I think Jesus. Did that even have networking already? Uh, it feels incredibly old, even though it was only 12 years ago. And 32 years ago is the beginning of time before nothing existed. Uh, this kind of thinking in these, these scales is good if you are developing products that have a similar lifespan, mobile phones being the canonical example. Uh, if we're looking at civil infrastructure, things are a bit different. Uh, first thing you can look at who makes civil infrastructure and for that look no further than the members of the CIP project, which are obviously engaged in that kind of stuff. There are nine of them. All of them are corporations and four have been around for more than a hundred years. Those being uh, Siemens, Toshiba, Bosch and Hitachi. Uh, so, that's generations. I think Siemens predates Germany. So that's quite a bit. Um, so these are superhuman timescales. Nobody lives that long. Um, 
So that gives you kind of a hint. We left that frame like uh, back when we were young and we're now at the point where we say back when my great great grandfather wasn't born yet. But uh, these are just names, of course. No, no person who works for these companies is the same anymore and they're also largely not using the same technology anymore. So what about the actual stuff? Um, I call it stuff because honestly I could not come up with a term that describes everything from elevator controllers to fusion reactors. I just call it the stuff. Here's a bit of stuff. This is the Yaruga 2, a hydroelectric power station in Croatia. That's the river Krika in the front. And uh, it's number two. It has an older sibling, number one, Yaruga 1. That was built in 1895. And it's distinction is that it is the second oldest of its kind, the second oldest uh, multi-phase alternating current power station. The first one was uh, went up two days before that on Niagara Falls in the US. And if you didn't know anything about the state of telecommunications technology at the time, you would think they did that on purpose. But it was probably just a coincidence. So a couple of, later, uh, couple of years later, Yaruga 2 was built because new industry popped up in the area and more electricity was needed. So this was uh, completed in 1903 and it went online in 1904. And that's the end of the story because in this year of our Lord 2023, it's still online. And it still does the same thing that it did 120 years ago without any fundamental changes. It has been refurbished about four times per century. Um, I think in 36 or 37, they installed an additional generator, but it's fundamentally the same plant. And uh, it's a production power station. It's not something that technology enthusiasts keep alive for fun or as a tourist attraction. This is production. It supplies energy to the grid. And it is not an outlier. Uh, power stations of similar vintage, there are plenty of those that are still running. And if you look at slightly younger ones, younger as in only 70 years old or 80 years old, there are at least dozens, if not hundreds. I didn't count all of them, but I would say it's in the hundreds. So the actual stuff also lasts for forever, for generations. So. If you have something like that, if you want to run Linux or if you want to use Linux in running it, and you probably do, um, what kind of a kernel would you want for that? You don't want any regressions ever. If something works, it should keep working, no exceptions. That is uh, understandable that you would want that, but uh, there's an easy way to achieve that. Just don't update your kernel which for some applications would actually work. But for, uh, in many cases, you want stuff fixed. You want bad bugs to be fixed, things that might break stuff in the future that haven't been triggered yet. And of course, exploitable vulnerabilities. You don't want anybody else to break your stuff. So that actually needs updates. So you need, it needs to be maintained. You, how, uh, you also want uh, to keep the same code base as long as possible, and that's maybe not immediately clear what the benefit of that is. But uh, there's uh, one thing is in major kernel updates, regressions are inevitable. And uh, I'd like to open a parenthesis here. I wanted to back that up with numbers because that's a claim that is kind of, you know, I pulled that out of my ass. Uh, but I, I wanted to show a nice graph that shows, okay, you change your kernel, you die. Um, Unfortunately, we haven't been doing that for long enough yet, so I don't actually have meaningful numbers. I can crunch the numbers, but uh, if you want to identify regressions, you need to look into the future. Because if we knew it was wrong, we wouldn't have put it in the kernel yet. So we will only know in the future if something, uh, if a patch was bad. And we've only been doing a few releases uh, so far, so I might be undercounting regressions, especially in the super long-term support kernel. So I didn't feel comfortable giving you numbers, but uh, unofficially, I am incentivized to think that it's bad. It's actually worse, very bad. Uh, the other thing that is less uh, disputable is that if you change your entire operating system kernel, you might have to recertify. I don't know anything about the actual 
practice of that. I'm an open source developer. I throw code over a fence and then what people do with that, it's their business. But I've yet to meet anybody who says we had a great time doing recertification. <laughs> so how, how do you provide something like that? We thought about that and we have an approach uh, how you can provide such a kernel in the face of limited resources. Step one is limit the scope. We are not maintaining a kernel that you can drop into everything from IoT devices to supercomputers. It's intended to be used in specific cases. And what those cases are is informed by our members' needs. Uh, if you are an embedded Linux developer or probably an embedded operating system developer in general, you know that you're not necessarily told what your stuff is being used for. But at least in the CIP project, we know our members' platforms, we have reference platforms, and we know their kernel configuration. So we have an idea what our stuff is being used for, and we can focus on those things. Now, uh, I've been telling somebody that over a beer recently, and the first thing they said is, oh, that's a proprietary thing. Uh, I'd like to point out, no, it's not. We are not exclusively uh, doing that stuff. We don't intentionally leave things by the wayside because they're not part of what our members need. We do the other stuff as well on a best effort basis. And we also accept outside contributions. So if we say, okay, we didn't put that in because it's too much work, you, you can do the work for us and uh, say, you, I did that, I tested it here, have some, and we will look upon that favorably and we will probably include it. The other thing is within uh, that scope, we want to minimize changes as much as possible. If it's not trivial or important, it's out. That's an uh, inclusive or. Uh, if it's trivial, if you can see it's a one-liner patch, it's correct, it's in. There's no, no question about that. If it's important, if it can break something, if it's exploitable, if it's like, if you really want to have it fixed, it's in no matter how complicated it is, because what are you gonna do? We just have to invest that effort. If it's neither, which uh, in other words means it's a complicated, useless mess, then it's not gonna go in because backporting may introduce bugs and you need to have some benefits for that. Why would you do it if there is no benefit? And the more complicated a patch is, the more likely it is, it is that something will go wrong. So we only do that when it's actually important. The good news is that most patches for stable kernels are small, like as in really small one-liners, and they typically deal with uh, stuff where you say, the well, of course, like didn't check for out of memory, didn't uh, bring down the clocks again when a device fails to probe, checked for the wrong return value, checked for an zero when you should check for negative one, for e equality if it should be inequality, things like that. That's the vast majority of patches in stable and these are of course very easy to backport if you need backporting at all. So this is how we do it, or more specifically how I do it. Uh, I am maintaining the 4.4 kernel and part of that is policy, part of it is best practice, and part of it is my own judgment, but this is how it actually happens. So step one is ingest all the patches. We originally base our stuff on LTS. Once LTS is no longer maintained, we don't have patches anymore that we can apply. So we just do the next best thing and look at the next supported LTS kernel. At the moment, that is 4.14, and just hoover in every patch there is we have a tool for that and just throws that just throws all these patches at the 4.4 kernel and see what sticks. If it applies, okay, we leave it in for now. If it doesn't apply, it gets put on the side. And uh, this tool produces a log file. And that is, in my opinion, the most important thing about the entire project. That log file um, details what we put in, what we don't put in, what automatically applied, what had to be manually backported, what was ignored, why it was ignored. Uh, basically, you know exactly why something went into the SLTS kernel or did not, if you look at that file. Um, once that is done, you have to look at the stuff that didn't work. What about the patches that didn't apply cleanly? Most of them don't 
are not applicable at all. That is to say, they, they don't make sense in the context of the 4.4 kernel. The most obvious case being it's a fix for a driver that doesn't exist yet. You can obviously ignore that. Uh, another very common case is uh, it's a fix for a problem that was introduced after 4.4. You don't need that either. And that's the, if not the majority, then at least the plurality of patches fall into the category. So most of the stuff you can just ignore. Uh, the next step is uh, backport the easy ones. Remember when it's trivial, it goes in. If it's a one line or if it's correct, you just backport that. I don't generally spend time thinking about how important is that? Do we actually need that? Because it's faster to just backport the thing if it's obviously correct. Um, and the other thing that needs to be backported and um, are the important patches, the stuff that basically the point why we're all doing this is the really bad things that need to be fixed. Um, what was I getting at? Yeah, these are the ones that were mentioned earlier in the comment by the kernel maintainer is that it gets increasingly difficult to maintain an old uh, code base the older it gets. And that is true, but it only applies to this specific case, the important patches that need to be backported even though they are not trivial. And in practice, that extremely rarely happens. There's maybe one per release. I, I think the worst was like two or even none. So th this is, uh, yes, that's difficult, but it's a very rare case. So once all the patches that didn't apply have been reviewed, you have to look at the ones that have applied because just because something applies doesn't mean it actually works. In some cases, um, somewhere down the line, a bit of code was removed and then somebody thought about it and said, oh, maybe we shouldn't have removed that and then it gets added again. But it has never been removed from the 4.4 kernel. But because the uh, patch only sees a small snippet of the context, it might still apply, so you might have the same piece of code in that twice. So you actually have to look at all the patches that do apply. Do they make sense? After that, we basically have everything that we want in a release on top of the previous release, and we need to run a few tests. Usually these local compile tests, they go together with reviewing the patches that automatically apply because that's actually the easiest way to find them because they use APIs that don't exist yet. Stuff that doesn't make sense very easily falls out of those compile tests. And the other thing is the Linux CI PCI, which uh, we, uh, as project members, we can use to just push a kernel up and have it run through the entire test suite. Uh, through which all of our stuff goes once it's released anyway. After that, the next step is push out a release candidate tree. That is for review. Um, and then I send a request to CIP dev, that's our developer mailing list, um, and ask for reviews of the backports. Final step, release. There are four flavors of the SLTS kernel. Um, once reviews are done, tests pass, uh, we release, or I release the 4.4 ST kernel, that's the vanilla SLTS kernel, that contains all the stable patches that are not specific to vendors or to, to our member stuff. Uh, the, the next step is merge the, this new ST kernel into the 4.4 CIP kernel. That is a kernel that contains a lot and I mean a lot with uh, capital letters, of uh, member patches that are specific, that are submitted by our members that they would like to see in their 4.4 kernel, even though they were not yet enabled at that time. And that is uh, the thing that you saw mentioned in the first quote about the billion backported patches. And again, yes, yes, they are a billion or something like that. but completely hassle-free, never had an issue with that, even though there are lots of them, it just works. So that might sound like a big effort, but in practice it actually isn't. And then there are more, two more flavors, which I'm currently not maintaining, Pavel is still maintaining that. Those are the real-time branches, again 4.4 ST, the vanilla SLTS kernel, 
with the real-time patches and 4.4 CIPRT. The process is similar, so I'm not gonna go into that here. So, what's the point of that? Why, why am I telling you that? Why am I telling you in detail how I do every patch, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, the thing is, uh, cheap and easy, if you remember the quote from before, that's not what we're going for. What you want is long-term stability until the end of times. And what this is to show you is not, it's not to encourage you to go ahead now and start a new project with 4.4 LTS, even though it's not, uh, 4.4 SLTS, even though it's such a great kernel maintained by me and everybody wants it. You are not supposed to do that. Uh, the point is that, uh, is to show you that we are willing and able to do that. It's a proof of concept and uh, to show you that uh, if you start your project today with 6.1 SLTS, we are going to be there and we are going to maintain that thing. We'll keep it running for as long as it takes. Yeah, that's it already. So thank you for listening on behalf of the team as well. And I think I was much faster now than I thought I would be. So <laughs> there is time for questions. <laughs> Yes. There's a Thank you. Um, in the patches that you apply, what is the percentage of security versus all the general bug fixes? I can't give you an exact number, but I think it's pretty low. Uh, we also have an announcement for every new release that details which security uh, uh, issues have been fixed. It's a, a small number compared to the overall number of patches. Um, so now it's 4.4, mm -hmm. I just saw 6.1 is, is mm -hmm. the next one. Have you thought about scaling? Because per new SLTS you decide to have, you basically need a... Do you have a separate maintainer? I mean, this will stack up over time, right? We will have a yeah, lot of uh, SLTS kernels. I think we don't want to go beyond what we, uh, what we currently have, which is 4.4, 4.19, 5.10 .4 and 6.1. You already have four. We have four, yeah. And, and you're maintaining them all? No, we have three maintainers. Okay. And, uh, well, as you can see, a lot of other people who are working on that. But we have three people who are basically specifically for that, maintaining the, the SLTS kernels. Thanks for the talk. Um, how are you making sure that there are no new regressions introduced or um, maybe um, more security uh, issues in the old kernels that you that you're trying to maintain. Is there some uh, some um, testing process going on in the vendors or at CIP? Uh, there is, yeah. Chris, do you want to say anything about that? <laughs> Um, we're collaborating with other testing projects like Kernel CI to, to build up, reuse their stuff as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're testing. We, we don't have so many specific tests for like specific CVEs and seeing whether they're exploitable still and stuff like that. It is kind of like, would be nice, but as with all these projects, it's a case of how much time you've got and the resources for which we're doing. Yeah. Slowly getting there, but hopefully that helps. <laughs> So anyone running such an old kernel would probably do so on an old hardware. So how do you plan to test on the long run? I'm, so, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. I so also can't see you. Where are you? <laughs> yeah. ah. <laughs> so uh, what hardware do you test, uh, plan to test on the long run? Uh, we have reference platforms and we use those. That is the best I can tell you about that. Maybe to follow up on the question regarding how, how do we scale, how do we want to scale. Um, so the current promise is over 10 years. Uh, so as long as it takes is we think we take us 10 years uh, right now to keep the kernels alive. That's the promise. And that 
does the math that if we continue to release uh, the commit on one kernel uh, every two years, we will end up at max with five kernels in flight. Um, that has to be kept this way. Obviously, the scale out depends on the capacity that we have as a project, and that's also a limitation factor. I mean, if there's a larger interest, then you have possibly the possibility to extend that. If it really has to be extended beyond 10 years, it's to be seen. But this is the current, current plan on that. Uh, I'm interested if you have to respect some kind of upgrade paths between the kernels, or is, is that only on the 25-year scale? <laughs> that is a good question. I don't actually know that. Upgrade path? <laughs> um, about the, the, the upgrade of the kernel itself. So if the, the, the super LTS kernel is somehow fixed, um, it, the, there needs to be an upgrade on the facility, on, on mm -hmm. the stuff itself. So um, is there some kind of agreed on um, border, um, what kind of upgrade on the stuff is considered um, harmless, so there is no need for a recertification or things like that, and beyond that there is a need for a recertification? I, I guess that depends on your regulatory body when they require recertification or not. We try to make the kernel in such a way, I mean the point of the kernel is that you can really just drop it in and don't have to be afraid that something goes wrong. Of course, do test it because you know, something always goes wrong, but uh, the aim is that it's drop in and there is no issue with that. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, do you have a list or a collection of fixes you're not going to backport if they are too complex, like the microarchitectural spectral fixes or fixes to IO Uring or something like that? Yes, we do. Uh, like I said, we have that file, for 4.4.org, uh, 4 that details everything and specifically what isn't included because uh, it, keeps me honest because I can say, okay, it's easier to throw something out because then I don't have to do any work, but there has to be a reason for that. And that's uh, detailed there. And if there are very prominent components that are left out, we also have a known box file inside the kernel tree that explains those things. Um, apart from announcing uh, the CVEs that got fixed, do, do you ha also have a more elaborate process for handling CVEs? Because I would imagine that over the years they accumulate, right? You, you, sh sh um, you probably have fixes for like 400 CVEs there or even thousands. I mean... Th there is a repository. I uh, unfortunately forgot the name. I'm actually using that to make these announcements that tracks these things. So the CIP project has its own repository that tracks such issues. So now the question got me curious. Did you backport the spectrum mitigation fixes? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the reason for that is uh, it's very intrusive, it's very tricky, and it's very hard to test. So we thought, is it actually necessary? And the conclusion was um, the use cases run a specific set of user space binaries and nothing else. So bar there being some other vulnerability that allows you to get in, it's not exploitable. These, these specul uh, speculation bugs are not exploitable, so we left it out. That is a very prominent example that is also in the aforementioned known bugs file. We didn't do that. Do you use, uh, do you use the fixes tag in your backport process? You didn't mention this in the process, so do you use it, make a use of the fixes? In yes, the we do make comment. use of the fixes. Uh, I use it to semi-automate finding out if stuff actually applies uh, or is necessary or not. If uh, something fixes an issue that is not in 4.4, I can find that out uh, by, via the fixes tag and that makes it a bit easier. I still look over every single patch, but that already gives you an idea which way you're supposed to look. So yes, we are making use of that. 
And then the follow-up question, uh, what else from the upstream maintainers could make your life easier? I mean, uh, is there something which you want to ask uh, co co <laughs> Correct fixes tag is really very helpful because many aren't. Like people just come up with, uh, okay, yeah, Linux 2.6 is what's being fixed. You know, that's the, that's the favorite. You know? And some are just not correct because that bug originates somewhere else and it's just triggered by something and then that is uh, considered a fixed thing, which it actually isn't because the bug actually originates somewhere else. So correct fixes tags would be really, really helpful. So uh, recently we found a bug which had originated in 3.7 kernel and mm -hmm. we noticed that you have picked that patch up. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, in reverse, when you find bug fixes that is coming in, let's say, 4.4 .4 kernel, what's the process that you insist on ensuring that bug fix goes upstream into the latest kernel? Uh, basically, so we find a bug in 4.4 that is also in upstream. Yeah, how do you enforce that? Uh, we get our fixes from LTS, so typically those things are already sent to be included in mainline and just are siphoned off to stable and thus end up in our kernel. So that usually doesn't happen. I don't think it has ever happened so far that there is something. If, if we have something that is specific to the SLTS kernel, then uh, it's something that is a regression in the SLTS kernel and there's not somewhere else. So that has happened before. But typically we don't have anything that actually needs to go to mainline. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so for the backported fixes, the rules in stable are that you should never uh, backport it to an older LTS if it's not already in the newer LTS. So it's some uh, waterfall model. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what do you do with all the extra code that's in the CIP kernel? Because some of that are, I guess, backports, backports from a very recent kernel. Some of that is code that's not yet upstream. Mm -hmm. There may be bugs there as well. Hmm? Only backports, really? Yeah. Okay, but it means that uh, if you backport, uh, okay, so everything should be fixed. So if, if you backport a fix, then uh, if there's a similar issue in one of the CIP extra stuff, then it should have already been fixed upstream as well, because it's upstream only. Okay. Maybe it also clarify on that. So really we have this upstream first policy for the suggested feature backports, board support uh, backports. It's a clear rule. Um, I'm not aware of exception of this. So if we had any, bring it up. Um, that implies obviously you cannot only look at 414 to identify all fixes relevant for the 44 kernel because actually some may only affect 510. Uh, because this is where the, the story started, so to say, for that uh, stuff which is not, wasn't in 4.4 back then. So that's why you are reviewing um, also, the, well, we are starting to review on the 6.1 baseline mm -hmm. currently um, and ended up even newer to get aware of fixes which basically have to jump from the, the, old, the oldest LTS or the newest LTS whatever to our CIP kernel. But really, this is not a vendor kernel in the sense that you really have stuff there which hasn't been approved by upstream yet. Uh, hi. How do you track your patches? Do you have a tool for that or you do it manually? How do we track the patches? Uh? Yes, for example, you uh, backport patches from uh, like New York LTS kernel to yours and then uh, you obviously uh, drop something, something getting automatically applied, something you need to rebase. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously it requires some, lots of maybe manual work or maybe there is some tool that you use. I'm not talking about tool that applies automatically, I'm talking about yeah, no, that tracks tool, your patches. That tool also does the tracking, or at least it creates the template for the tracking. 
So okay. we have a look of these patches and we append that to a file. And as, as the process goes along, as backporting happens, as review happens, this template gets filled in with the, the relevant information. Has it been put in or not put in? How, how did it go in? Why did it go in? Why did it not go in? And that's where all of that stuff is being tracked. So yeah, we do have that. So thanks for doing this. I'm wondering how much time do you spend uh, doing this each week on average? Uh, personally, I spend two days per week. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, do you use any of the tooling which Greg and Sasha used to assemble the LTS kernels? Because apparently they used some automated scripting as well. I think ours is completely homegrown. Uh, yeah. Well, theirs is probably as well, but is there some overlap? Functionality-wise, there probably is overlap, but I have to admit I haven't looked into that. Because I basically joined the project and the tooling was there, so I'm just using it. So. Thanks. Um, I think you had uh, one sentence on the slides where you talked about not only uh, the kernel but also other stuff of the system. Is that what? What other stuff is that? Or um, misunderstanding that? Uh, this uh, CIP, the, uh, the civil infrastructure platform, includes user space. That's that's the only thing I can think of right now. So it's a combined user space and kernel. And do you also do um, a patch tracking there or? Uh, that I don't know, I'm only a kernel maintainer. Jan can say something about that. <laughs> so the strategy for user space is that we align with Debian um, and, and uh, initially thought we had to do the same thing as Ulrich and, and Kos are doing now with the 4.4, but fortunately Debian LTS and ELTS projects um, step forward and we are supporting them for a while now. So the strategy here is to uh, basically bring our requirements into these projects and support them together with others from other domains. So what would be the next version of an SLTS? Uh, the, mo the latest and greatest is 6.1. Yeah, the next one? Uh, after 6.1? or? Yeah. Oof, I don't think we know? thought that far yet. That depends on how Got things... Got an estimate? Like how many I cannot really estimate. It like will definitely be... Or 15, hmm? 6 .10 or 15, 6.10 or 6.15 or... 6.10 6 is a good guess because just from the distance of version numbers, yeah. <laughs> um, what we have is 4.4, 4.19, 5.10 and 6.1, so you can extrapolate from that yeah. if you okay. want an estimate. <laughs> so there's no real problem. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <laughs>